Hey listeners, you know we've got a Patreon, right? Where supporters get early access to all our podcasts, bonus episodes, discounts on merch, and access to the Feminist Frequency Discord? Well, now you do. Get all this fun stuff while supporting our show at patreon.com slash femfreak. That's F-E-M-F-R-E-Q. Hey, hello, hi, me again. Real quick, if you are a Patreon member, you get access to the live, unedited video recording of this episode with all of our special guests' extensive Titanic show and tell. It's pretty spectacular. I wouldn't miss it if I were you. If you aren't a Patreon member, you can become one really easily. You know the drill. Go to patreon.com slash femfreak. Oh boy, I would try and drown as many people around me as I could just because I would be so mad at God. Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Anita Sarkeesian, and I'm joined today by a woman who was rooting for the iceberg the entire time, Ebony Adams. What's up? When the ship docks, I'm getting off with you. For some unfathomable reason, we decided to start this latest season of Feminist Frequency Radio with a film that Ebony and I have actively avoided for the last 25 years. James Cameron's epic blockbuster, Titanic. Released in 1997, the movie was the highest grossing film of all time for many years, being the first to ever gross over a billion dollars worldwide. That's only second to his next dumb movie, right? Is not Avatar? Okay, okay, okay. It's very likely that you already know the broad strokes of the film's plot. Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio play Jack and Rose, or Rose and Jack, depending on what order you want to say those things in. Two young people from vastly different social worlds who encounter each other on the fateful maiden voyage of the RMS Titanic. Rose is desperate to avoid the stifling existence she seems destined for as an uber-rich society wife. And it is through Jack's open-armed embrace of life's simple pleasures that she finds the drive to really chase what she wants. Just when things reach a feverish pitch of connection between our nubile young leads, the fateful events of April 15th, 1912 throw a giant icy wrench in the works. You know how the story ends, but how does it get there? To answer that question, we have Caitlin Durante, Titanic superfan. (laughs) You also might know her as Paddington Superfan, mm. or as a stand-up comedian, or as a co-host of the Bechtel cast, or just like someone who hangs out on our podcast all the time. Mm. <laughs> What's up, Caitlin? Thank you so much for having me. I do like that so much of my brand is either just like being Titanic's number one fan and Paddington's number one fan. I appreciate you also just calling attention to those things. So thank you. It really is so much of your identity. Did I see it when it came out? Yes. Can you tell us, like, were you a child child, a small teeny (laughs) child when this came out? I was 11. Uh, The movie came out at the end of 97. It was like, you know, the holiday season of 97, if I remember correctly. I don't think I saw it until 98, though. So this movie was famously in theaters for months, right? So I saw it for the first time in a drive-in movie theater in rural western Pennsylvania, Now, for that to have been true, uh, it would have had to be in, like, March, probably, like, April at the earliest, because that drive-in theater didn't open until the spring. So I didn't see it in, like, a movie theater. I saw it in this drive-in in in the spring of 98. Then, and I was uh, hooked. Hooked immediately. I was 11 going on 12. Did you have a Leo poster on your wall? I didn't, because I've never... I... (laughs) <laughs> okay, so the reason I love this movie so much, <laughs> I don't really care for the love story. And in fact, I've really come around on... Well, that's great because you've got two fucking hours of dying. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I love about this movie. I will like s- wait through, plod through the like period drama romance story uh, for the first, yeah, like, uh, whatever, an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, and I'm, what I'm really waiting for is the ship to spot the iceberg, hit the iceberg, and then sink. That's the best part of the movie. And it's enough of the movie that 
it is <laughs> uh, not my favorite movie, but it's right up there. It's enough that I have really invested a lot of time and energy into letting everyone know uh, <laughs> that this, again, is a huge part of my brand. Can you give us some examples of things you might have done, permanent changes you might have made <laughs> that would indicate to an observer how much this movie means to you mm -hmm. or meant to you. It's funny that you mention it because uh, I perhaps did get a tattoo, a tattoonic. A ta <laughs> at, at age 12. <laughs> yes, I was like, mom, <laughs> I'm getting a tattoo. I guarantee um, you there were kids giving themselves little prison tattoos. Uh, in the elementary school yard. So you would not have been alone. No, what I did do is actually, I did get a tattoo at the ripe age of 35. It was my first tattoo. Uh, and it was earlier this year. Or it was I like mean, mid 2021. So it was recently. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. You did yeah, this no, no, no. recently. Yeah, yeah. Ho okay. Y'all, this is why it's good that we're recording this visually because the. <laughs> Did you see my asking why? I thought this shit happened like 10, 15, mm -hmm. maybe 20 years ago. But this mm -hmm. happened recently. This was a yes. pandemic too. This was something yes. that happens. Y'all. I made this choice very recently. It's true. Okay. As someone who has tattoos from a young age that I do not like, I kind of love that you're like, I have lived with this movie for like 20 years and I want to That's what I'm have saying. it permanently memorialized onto my body. Like at this age, you're like, yeah, I kind of am set in my ways now. I know what I like. I, you know, whatever. I like, I mad respect for that. That is very much the logic behind this. Except tattoo. it's a stupid movie. So Except that's dumb. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not going to argue against that even. Um, but okay, show, but we got to show Ebony the tattoo. I will. Come so, on. so basically, I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, I'm 35. I don't have any tattoos yet. What have I liked long enough that I will that I won't regret putting something on my body? And I was like, I've loved Titanic for twenty five years. Okay, I'm not. I'm gonna close my eyes. I'm gonna guess before you okay. do the reveal. Okay, okay. But my top three um, wishes for this tattoo. Uh huh. It is one. Billy Zane going to action mamba at the end of the movie, trying <laughs> to shoot down Jack and Rose. <laughs> An amazing moment, but no. Okay. Is it a depiction? Oh God, this is, we, you know, we might as well get into it. I'm a horrible person, y'all. The laughter I let out when the ship broke in half <laughs> and the ship was standing vertically in the water and those people were following the noises that the master sound editor put to those people smacking against parts of the ship. I love everybody's eyes so hard. I'm I so love hard. that Ebony's okay. eyes are closed this whole time. Yes, I don't want to open my eyes and run it. So my other prediction is that it's a depiction of a man in a tux falling, and maybe there's sounds coming out of his mouth, like a speech bubble that's like, ah! Oh, like the Wilhelm scream? Yeah. That is not my tattoo either. Okay, is it my third and final prediction? Is it a tattoo, a close-up of the incredible Kathy Bates' face? <gasps> that would be a good one tattoo to get and i might get it but no that is not okay problem. i don't know what else it could be because if i was gonna get a tattoo of something from titanic <laughs> it would be one of those tattoos. um no i i really it's much simpler than all that you're way more creative than i am in thinking of tattoo ideas are you ready for the big reveal so it is just the ship oh. hurling toward the iceberg I love some good old, just like beautiful line art. That's actually very, very cool. Thank Isn't it you. beautiful? Like despite it being a Titanic tattoo, it's a really nice tattoo. Yeah. I also feel mm. like it embodies a lot of my just sort of general life philosophy because you'll see that the Titanic is not, uh, has not collided yet with the iceberg, but it is on the collision course. And I, but it's like, well, maybe it, it'll still have time to veer off course and, and that's kind of just like my life. I'm like, everything seems like it's about to fall apart, but maybe it will and maybe it won't. I don't know. I love that. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I also love that it gives the opportunities, like if you want for friends, partners, lovers to color with marker on your <gasps> skin and have like a little like artist party that can be wiped clean. 
and then redone all the time. I, you I actually like a know psychedelic, you know, tattoo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can do like a sort of art deco version. I'm loving this, Caitlin. I, I actually know you know need my validation, but I'm giving it to you. I actually would like your validation and I appreciate it. I know someone with a circle tattoo and that she has people drawing it all the time. Oh, that's and it's cool. just a circle. Yeah. Love it. Okay, Ebony, what's your relationship with this movie? I'm gonna tell you right now. I hate no, it. Not not your opinion, but I no 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 no. I want my know. relationship is hate because it's loaded. That's my <laughs> okay. relationship. So Ebony, okay, hold. I'm, I'll start with mine then because Ebony is being difficult. Uh, <laughs> um, so when this came out, when I was like a a young teen, like I was either in like middle school or like early high school. I think I was in early high school, and that was a period in my life where I was like. <clears throat> fuck everything mainstream. So if everybody wanted to see something, I would not go see it because why would I like things that normal people like? That's ridiculous. Also, Leo was like the big heartthrob at the time. And I was having none of that. Didn't give a fuck about any of that, except Romeo and Juliet is an amazing movie. Mm. I will fight people about that one. Um, And so I was just like, I wouldn't see it because it was like a sappy love story. And it was a thing that everybody else wanted to see. And so I just, I didn't. And then I'll, I, have I've made it all of these years and it wasn't like an active thing to not see it. But I, I also want to root this in the fact that like, it was epic. Like this was a huge, huge deal when it came out and like around it. So now I feel like there's almost like a badge of honor being like, never saw that movie. Mm. (laughs) So when Ebony was like, let's do segments about movies we never saw and never want to see. And like, I almost said Titanic at the same time that Ebony said Titanic was like, we both were like, whoa, this is, well, this is very much um, like, it's very similar to that. So I was much older than both of you when you came out. I think I was in my first or second year of grad school already when this film came out. So I was a diggity daggone adult making all of my own media choices, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So there was no way I was going to see this movie unless I made the decision to see this movie. Like I wasn't, my dad, huge James Cameron fan. I imagine had I been younger and still living in the house, we would have gone as a family to see it. Um, We were huge fans of Aliens, Terminator, like Mm -hmm. big supporters of his work, right? Had no reason to suspect the shit was going to get wild um, with old Jimmy um, <laughs> in this movie. But I didn't see it for a lot of the reasons Anita has mentioned, which is that it just seems so ubiquitous that it almost was like, I don't need to see this movie. Everyone has told me what happens. I mean, in the fictional part, I already know, you know what happened with the Titanic, <laughs> right? Um, I know what happens. I've heard the fucking Celine Dion song every time I get in the car or, you know, turn on the radio. I've seen the posters. I, it's almost like I've seen this film already. And then the longer it got, you know, from um, it sort of being like something that was in the cultural consciousness that you could not escape, the less necessary it seemed to watch it, right? Then we get to Avatar. And at this point, I recognize that James Cameron has lost his dego mind. And I'm not, (laughs) you know, like he is no longer the director that I thought he was, or perhaps he's still the director. He always has been. He just got lucky earlier in his career. So I just, I took a stand. I took a principal stand against James Cameron, (laughs) against James Cameron. You know, I was like, I'm firmly team Linda. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, this dude's a douche. And so I'm not going to see it. I was in agony after Anita agreed that we would. This was 100 percent your idea. It absolutely was. I did this to myself. (laughs) So up until I pressed play on this bitch last night. I was like, can I get out of this? Like, is there any way I can change or we can ask Caitlin to talk about something else? It gets going. And yeah, I do hate this movie, but I hate it for I like I hated watching it in a fun way. I think. Okay. I'm still recovering. It was 17 years long. It's it is certainly or in the memification of this film, it's been 84 years. It It lasted forever forever there's a scene where bill paxton's character the guy who's going after the heart of the ocean (laughs) like we've gotten through i don't know how much of old rose's recitation and we come back to the future and he's like we still have six hours until it's i was like that's how i feel this is how i feel like there's six hours up to this movie you haven't even hit the daggone iceberg yet 
if you i don't know if anyone noticed this but so rose there's like this framing device where old rose is telling her story uh giving way much way too much detail because all bill paxton wants to know about is where the diamond is and she's like well in order for you to understand that i have to tell you about uh an affair that i had on a cruise when i was 17 (laughs) um and it's like, oh, poor Rose, like, clearly, you know, no one wants to hear it. Like, you, this is just like an opportunity for you to like, finally tell this secret, whatever. The story is so long that the characters in the movie who are listening to the story chain are in different outfits at one point. So as if to say a day has passed, and they come back a second day to listen to the rest of the story. So that's how I felt. <laughs> Okay, so this movie is weird because it, um, I felt like I had already seen it, even though I know I haven't, right? Like, so much of the visuals and, like, the memes and everything around this movie are so familiar Mm -hmm. that I'm, like, like, I I recognized a lot of it. Um, I'm king of the world. Draw me like one of your French girls. Okay, whoa, It's been 84 years. I... I thought Draw Me Like One of Your French Girls was an internet thing. I didn't know it was from this movie. What? And when she said it, I was like, I mean, it was so not dramatic. It was like the most boring delivery of this thing that's now a thing. I was, it, I, I had, I paused the movie. No, I didn't pause the movie because I refused to make it any longer than it was. <laughs> I w- had a moment though mm. uh, with my neighbor who I bribed with dinner to watch this with me because I didn't want to do it alone. And nobody wants to watch this fucking movie. Why didn't you invite uh, me over? <laughs> I don't know, Caitlin. I texted you the whole time though. <laughs> yeah. Um, this anyway. is very interesting though, Anita. Like you're, the fact that you, you didn't know where that particular line came from. So you're experiencing it fresh for the first time in the year of our Lord, 2022, right? And your reaction is, oh, this is not the reading I would have expected. This is not the delivery that I would have expected because I have 25 years worth of parodies and satirizations of this line existing in my head, right? I kept coming up against this while viewing this film, get a little like cheesy invoking Proust here, but the past is a different country, right? They do, they do things differently there. It is impossible for me to know, but I suspect that if I were like between the ages of 10 to 14, when this film came out and I had seen it then, I would have loved it. Not because I was necessarily like a less sophisticated viewer, but I had different concerns as a viewer, right? And I was not as exposed to like the crushing weight of everyone else's um, sort of like commentary on film at that point. At this point, I'm a dried up old husk of a woman, right? (laughs) So I take everything, you know, with a very large, tasty grain of salt. And so part of the reason why I was largely unmoved by this film is because we have in many ways just done such a disservice to, um, to ourselves as viewers by sort of never letting things I don't know, uh, like not allowing us to digest anything without wondering how can this be repackaged in bite-sized bits for a sketch, for a TikTok video, for mm. whatever, right? So it was it was really hard to watch this film and be like, God, I wonder how much I would have loved this because I'm sure I would have, you know, if I was 13 watching it for the first time, you know, but now as an 87 year old woman, I'm like, oh my God, Rose was 17. And like, that's I couldn't stop thinking about the fact of how young they were. Mm -hmm. in this film you know as opposed to you know if i was 13 she would have seemed like impossibly old to me i would have had a different you know viewpoint on it yeah for sure i um so look i hate to admit this out loud but i think leonardo DiCaprio is a really good fucking actor and i always have and i i think the thing that made me not like feel like i was in agony the whole time is him and kate winslet I think he was, I think Kate Winslet has become a better actor over time. I think that, but I think she was fine in this. I think he was so good. Like there were these little movements of his facial expression and like his body that just, I was so enthralled with who this character was, even though I don't give a fuck about any of it, that I, that part of it, that Caitlin, that you're like, I don't really give a shit about any of this part. That was the only thing that I cared about because I thought the acting was so good like and and so everything else like 
old Kate. No, not old Kate, old Rose, <laughs> whatever say <same> thing, <laughs> which I was like, man, if I was 100 years old, there's no fucking way you're getting me on a helicopter going to a goddamn death ship. Like, I just want to die. I just want to be dead at this point. Um, but yeah, I that that actually was what kind of pulled me in more because I thought those performances were so good. I have to say that, like, there is there is a 90 minute movie inside of this 60 hundred year movie that is really good. That's like a solid fucking like love story action movie kind of thing. But the fact that it was that long was just agonizing to me. And I have a fear of drowning and also a fear of falling. So it was like after like after an hour, because I'm like, fine, cool, an hour, you know, whatever. and then like another fucking hour of people just like dying <laughs> and like, oh, my God. And like getting trapped and getting locked into these rooms where you're going to drown or potentially drown and being handcuffed. And then and then when the fucking ship tilts upwards and they're like dropping, I'm just I'm like, mm. I'm dying. I'm just like, I can't take this anymore. Like, I just it was too much. That did not. It did not need to be that long. <laughs> I don't disagree. In fact, I have a uh, I should just like edit the movie the way that I think it should be edited to it would still be probably two hours long but that's way better than three hours and 14 minutes right because I I resent any movie that is longer than an hour and 45 minutes I just I cannot and movies every movie can be 90 minutes if if you just try so <laughs> you hear that Hollywood I want to give James Cameron and Quentin Tarantino my personal cell phone number so that they can call me so that I can just say, shorten your fucking movies. Also, don't make movies. Maybe let someone else make movies. But, but get those dudes having your cell phone number and feeling free to contact you. Yeah, no. I mean, I don't really want that. But they need the like every the answer to every problem with this movie is that there's nobody around James Cameron to be like, no, yeah, like this is a bad true. idea. Like, get your head out of your ass. <laughs> there needs to not... There, no need for this framing device. There's 20 minutes of the movie before we even cut back to 1912. There's no need for such a long, drawn-out, um, like, ramping up of the, like, love story before the ship hits the iceberg. There's a large chunk of the aftermath, like, the sinking that can be cut. Like, I, I have big big ideas on how to make this a two hour movie. Um, so I don't disagree with that at all, but because I have, I can recite this movie beginning to end dialogue wise. I like, I can describe the whole thing scene by scene. It's so in my brain. I've seen this movie embarrassingly over a hundred times. I've spent, I like calculated at one time. I've have spent a week of my life watching Titanic <laughs> a week or more at this point, probably. Um, because the summer, so after it had its really long run in theaters, it came out famously on the two VHS set. And uh, my mom bought that for me, probably for my birthday that year, some, some, that summer, summer, summer of 98. I watched the movie with my sister every day for an entire summer, sometimes twice a day. And then since then, I've been watching the movie usually like five to ten times a year. <laughs> Like on background or like no, in the I'm background usually, or like usually, you're paying attention. Like, I'm usually I'm mean, and it's honestly probably once a month if I'm being honest with myself and others. So this movie is so much in my <laughs> <laughs> It's so much in my brain. And that's why I like I don't mind the stuff that sucks about it. For example, it being way too long. Um just because I like grew up with it and it was like in my brain as a kid onward. But there's, there's so much about this movie that is like definitely not good. A lot of the dialogue is badly it's written. It's so bad. I made I made several notes because I was like, this dialogue is the fucking worst. It's like, not good. And there's just, I'm like, just cut the line. Like, not just, ew. sorry. I, that was, I found that very frustrating. Mm -hmm. The romance is gross uh jack is coercive and shitty and bad and she's 17 and he's i think implied to be older and that's all weird and bad and it's just like a very problematic romance i'm rooting for the fabrizio 
uh, and other lady <laughs> romance. Um, I, I kept, um, I kept thinking about like, and this is this again. I this this kind of goes back to Ebony, what you're talking about with like, if you watch this as like a young girl, you'd probably have different feelings because really, you think about relationships differently as well. But I kept like the whole movie. I kept being like, yeah, you're gonna run away with him, and then you're gonna hate him in like a week. Like he's Absolutely. he's this he's like this like annoying guy who just like freestyles his life and you're gonna hate that when you're like no longer in this like puppy love moment and i couldn't help but be like there's nothing romantic about this or like charming about it and i'm like and an adult wrote this like it's not like a 14 year old wrote this as like their fan fiction fantasy you know everything james cameron done is you know is it produced by an adult brain questionable <laughs> I, I want to ask you, Caitlin, you know, so I want to veer from like sort of serious um, discussions of what happens in the book, because I mean, on the technical level, there's extraordinary stuff happening in this film. And oh, there yeah. are some attempts. I won't say they're all successful. There are some attempts to tackle like incredibly weighty, complex issues, right? Class. We'll stuff, get, right. Yeah, we'll get to that. I would like to ask you some non-serious stuff, which is, do you have a favorite character? Mm. Is it Billy Zane's hammy ass? Because I literally, there was a time, his villainy in this movie was pitched. It wasn't that it was even pitched at an 11. It was like he was in a different sort of movie entirely. And it's so yeah. clear when he's in scenes with Francis Fisher, who is wonderful as mm -hmm. Rose's mother, mm -hmm. this sort of understated, um, but incredibly firm control that she ex exercises or attempts to exercise upon Rose's life, you know, um, it positions her as one of the film's villains as well. We also have, what's his name, Livingstone, Lockett, Love It, I don't know, Cal's valet. Yes, lo Love It, I think. No, Brock Lovett. So his name, Lovejoy. He's he's Lovejoy. So you have these different models of villainy, you know, played by fantastic actors, Francis Fisher or, you know, David Warner, the other case. And then you have Billy Zane just mm -hmm. really hitting it over the fence in Hamtown. And so I couldn't, I couldn't take my eyes off. I was like, every scene he was in, I was just eating it up with a spoon. So but then also Kathy talking. Bates is wonderful. Yes. Mm. You know, Bernard Hill, had I known going in that King Theoden was going to be offering me his stoic older man best in another film, I probably would have watched it years ago. Mm-hmm. King Theoden of Lord of the Rings, which all of those movies are famously three hours long. But who's counting anyway? Uh, I will, because I'm like you with this movie. I have seen the Lord of the Rings films and especially Fellowship of the Ring at least 100 times. The fact that I don't have a tattoo is just testament to the fact that I can never keep more than $100 together at a time in my life. <laughs> okay, we, we, we are aligned there because I'm also a, a huge Lord of the Rings stan um to answer your question yes billy zane is my favorite character and kathy Bay, the unsinkable molly brown the two best characters in the movie uh let me i mean billy zane's line reads for every line i have a child <laughs> or he'll be like In my own luck. going to him <laughs> to be a whore to a gutter rat <laughs> Or uh, I put the diamond in the coat, and I put the coat on her. <laughs> so I, oh my god! Okay, gosh. at the end when he <laughs> when he starts fucking shooting them, and I was just like, "What is hat? Like mm. is like misogyny runs deep in this dude, man? Like sure." And I was like, "Okay, like this is a commentary about like control and misogyny." And then he's like, "No, the diamond," and you're like, "But you just gave the fucking diamond away. So what are you? I don't understand what mm. the what was that supposed to mean?" <laughs> I thought he was shooting at them because he's like, if if I can't have her, no one can. Yeah, that's what I thought. But then he made that whole stink about the fucking diamond. I think it was right. both things, right? You know, like, in his mind, it's all about um, uh, control and power. And his possession of Rose um, is a sort of mirror to the things that he, the other things that he wants that he is able to possess. So if he can't have Rose, he can at least still have the diamond, you know, I, I think it's, it's it's all about that, right? About possession and losing those things that he thought he possessed. 
Also, that fucking ugly ass necklace, which I'm sure there were like plastic creation recreations of I it. Mean for- this. <laughs> yeah, I mean that. Wow, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> okay, and I was in no way prepared for all of the bounty. <laughs> oh, can I? You didn't even. Okay, I'm wearing this sweatshirt. Yes. Okay, also for people who can't see, uh, Caitlin just held up a replica of the necklace and is wearing a hoodie that says Titanic on I'm it. I'm also under that, I'm wearing this. Let me try to not expose my bits, eh. but uh, this is. Wow. That's like the whole movie poster on a t shirt. Yes. Uh-huh. It's, it's like their face is your face. More or less. I also have. Um... <sighs> Yeah, keep, I keep can just coming. give you a tour of my apartment of everything <laughs> that's Titanic. Uh, I haven't even mentioned my six hundred and thirty dollar Lego Titanic set that I did oh, buy. And okay, assemble. that's kind of cool. Oh my god, it's Baby Leo! It's Baby Leo on a t shirt. That's a t shirt I own. Here's another one. This is not movie specific, nor is the um, Lego Titanic set. It is not like here's the thing from. It's not like. You don't have like little Jack and Rose like Lego people on it. It's just like here's the Titanic oh. as a Lego set. Well, that's a nice design. Yeah, it's a it's a sorry it's a t shirt that says what did it say White Star Line, RMS oh. Titanic, mm. and there's a little red flag on it mm-hmm. for folks. We should we should screenshot some of this stuff. We all need a little emotional support from time to time, but don't always have the resources or access to the support that understands us. I know it would have been life-changing if during the height of the online abuse against me to have anyone else who understood what I was going through. That's why me and my team built the Games and Online Harassment Hotline. We provide free, confidential, emotional support for people who make and play games. Because we are people who make and play games too, and we get it. You can learn more by texting INFO to 23368 from anywhere in the U.S. or visit gameshotline.org. That's INFO to 23368 or gameshotline.org. Okay, so this necklace thing, like, so she, (laughs) spoilers, whatever, she throws the necklace into the ocean at the end and Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, First of all, she's a hundred fucking years old in a negligee walking out into the freezing ocean on the deck. Like, woman, mm-hmm. what the fuck is wrong with you? She's a hundred years old. Uh, what else? Like, if if you're going to... And she's not wearing a negligee, folks. Come on. We've seen that old lady <laughs> nightgown she's wearing. Come on. It's nice. She's she's fully covered. It's like... Uh, what it's do you billowy. think a fucking negligee is? It's very billowy, whatever what, it is. It's billow. Well, because it's supposed to symbolize... Like, the whatever. Mm-hmm. Continue. <laughs> There's a moment in Kate's Kate Rose's dress, young Rose, where she has that like that flowy. She's wearing the thing. It's mm-hmm. it's a sim, it's some callback. Okay. Anyways, she throws the fucking necklace out, which we know that she has this whole time, obviously, because mm-hmm. that was clearly coming. And then I'm sitting there being like, sell the fucking necklace for your goddamn grandchild who you clearly don't care about, who's been taking care of your cranky ass, because I'm sure you're really annoying because you're a hundred years old, <laughs> and. And you're throwing it into the ocean where these people who are these like shitty capitalist people who just want to make a bunch of money are going to find it because they're looking for it. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with you? Rose is an idiot. It's infuriating. Yeah. She could have just like, do you know how many people she could have put through college if she sold that? How many like women of color she can fund (laughs) to like start businesses or go to college, like anything. You guys, listen, she was too busy riding a horse on Santa Monica Beach, okay? (laughs) Drinking bad beer. I knew that if the film did not end within 30 seconds after I saw the photo of the um, African tribesmen on her, Mm -hmm. you know, in her group of photos, I was like, if this movie doesn't end right fucking now, I'm out, you know? I was so, like, I'd had enough at that point just like one of the adventures you know that that our intrepid rose took was seeing black people whatever let's talk about some of the things uh, i want to talk about the class me. can we talk about the class yeah, that's what i was going to lead into right mm-hmm. because um the film starts with these uh these like these teeming masses you know, um, turn of the century that are very deliberately reminiscent of um, 
uh, shots of like Ellis Island, right? Mm. Which puts us in mind of a certain class of people and a certain type of people. That's not the film that we're gonna get. We're gonna get occasional glimpses into the lives of the people who live you know, outside of the first class. We'll have Jack, obviously, but he spends, if not, he spends as much time in Rose's world or more time in Rose's world, certainly than the, the world that, that he has come from. We get, you know, occasional simpering glimpses into the lives of these, you know, earthy, good time, poor people um, in steerage and below decks. But the film is not really concerned you know, no. with their lives, other than in the most cursory fashion. A much better film would have focused on those people. And if, and if, yeah. if, the, if the rich folks had to be included, would have made them the backdrop. How much more interesting would that have been? You know, the, the fight to get on a, a voyage like this, the way that people would have had to scrimp and save and steal you know, to make it possible to be part of this grand experiment, you know, bringing their families and then what they have access to, especially like the people who we know are responsible for building this marvel of engineering would would never be allowed to be above decks, you know, like the architect, the builder, the capitalists who fund it. Yes, they are allowed to have dinner with the caps and they're allowed to attend these grand balls. But, you know, the people who actually physically built this ship are never going to be allowed to, to enjoy it on the same level. How much more interesting would that story have been versus the one that we get? Especially because like James Cameron is clearly trying to make class commentary with this movie by being like, (laughs) in like very superficial ways a lot of the time where it's like look at the the poor people below deck having a freaking cool time they're having so much fun they're dancing they're drinking beer they're smoking cigarettes wee 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 and then it cuts to like a shot of like the boring like right rich guys who are talking about politics and business and we're meant to think oh my god so snooze they're so boring and look at how the poor people know how to have fun. Um, and it's like, okay, cool. James Cameron, thanks for your amazing insight. And then later on it, it, I guess this to me is a little more effective, but, uh, it's the whole thing where it's like, you know, who do we save in a, you know, catastrophe where there's only so many lifeboats and, you know, women and children first, but obviously the rich white women and children first. And then we'll see if we have space for um, people from the lower classes. Uh, And so there's all this kind of like cutting back and forth between the poor people who are like literally like locked in cages almost, like not able to access any kind of chance for survival uh, versus like, you know, they're picking up the little frail white women and being like, here you go, here you're in a lifeboat now. That to me feels more effective than some of the other stuff that he's trying to do. But it's still like, we're still, like you said, Ebony, focusing on the uh, like elite class for most of the movie, that's where Jack is spending most of his time. He's like in her world now versus like there's only one scene in which like she's in his world. Yeah, I think the to give James Cameron his due, the most pointed and effective class critique of the film for me, I think, um, is the way that we keep returning to the way that the workers on the ship mm-hmm. are paid to be the enforcers against the people that they should more naturally sympathize with, right? So the ways in which capitalism requires, particularly the middle class and middle class aspirants, you know, to defend the interests of the ruling class against, you know, the the, the huge numbers of people below them, even against their own best interests. So you have these incredible scenes where you you have like you know the the first officer and you have various you know um sailors on the ship mm-hmm. who are tasked with like you know choosing who's going to get onto these lifeboats but also choosing who can actually pass through certain areas of the ship you know like physically using their bodies right. to barricade certain and you have to ask yourself like what is going through the mind of someone who's just like head waiter on that boat and who you know takes it upon himself to say no 
I, I know what's happening. The wealthy people need to get to these boats in safety. And so not only am I not going to allow you, you know, Joe Carpenter from County Kildare to, to make it upstairs to these lifeboats. I also, I know that I'm also not going to be saved, but I'm using my actual life to defend the lives and the interests of the ruling class. That I found the most, you know, effective sort of mm-hmm. class critique of the film. And we keep returning to it. The one that drove me the absolute, like made me the most furious is the way people in this film keep using the term slavery. I feel like a slave, mm-hmm. you know, this slave shit. I was like, oh, I'm not gonna make it past 20 minutes and this thing. And that incredible scene where Francis Fisher, I, I can't remember Rose's mother's name. Ruth. Says to Rose, you know, like she's pulls her aside and says, I forbid you to see Jack again. Um, you know what's at stake here. All we have left is, you know, our good name and these horrible debts that your father left us. Mm-hmm. Would you see me working as a seamstress? And she is such a phenomenal actor that in that moment, you do feel empathy for her situation before you snap to and you're like, oh, wouldn't it be horrible if you had to go to work? <laughs> wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be a tragedy? <laughs> but oh she's so good at it. You're like, yeah. See her find things sold at auction for me to be working as a seamstress. <laughs> exactly, you know. And so the, the longer it plays out, the more you're like, yes, I am. I am allowing myself to recognize that no woman in this period, even the privileged, had the same range of choices as you know wealthy white men. But mm-hmm. nevertheless, lady, let's have some perspective. There is a there's a vast realm of possibility that exists, you know, um, or should exist between mm-hmm. essentially pimping out your daughter to this horrible man um, and, you know, a life of penury. But would you have me be a seamstress? Is that what you want to see, Rose? Yes, mother. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> wow, what a great film. <laughs> My second dumb question. Caitlin, mm, you've this movie over a hundred times. Mm-hmm. What in your mind is the worst way to die when this happens? Say you're a passenger on the Titanic, mm-hmm. you know what's going down, you know you're not gonna make it, right? What is the way you absolutely don't want to go? Okay. This let me I'm gonna have to talk through this. Because for example, you see someone below decks trying to like whatever electrical electrical system is rigged up he like tries to like flip a switch on this system and gets electrocuted presumably dies that sounds awful um the people the uh, obviously drowning is a is a a big possibility (laughs) here i definitely wouldn't want to drown uh definitely not in also freezing cold water with it like any chance of like swimming to safety or swimming to you know because obviously famously which we can talk about it or we don't have to because my opinion about the whole like was there room for jack on the door honestly i don't give a shit first of all the movie addresses this in text we see them both try to get on it it capsizes they tried once they did try off but he like went they're so cold and tired and they just tried to they and he's like cool i'm gonna die because i love you and i've met you for two seconds but we trust each other which is reiterated 500 fucking times in my defense (laughs) or in someone's defense jack has served his purpose he has like whatever given and this is also problematic but he's given like rose the confidence to like leave this shitty socialite life behind which again inherent problems in that whole premise but like like you said anita they're not gonna last past a week if say they do survive what they get an apartment together in new york they they like there, there's nothing compatible about them. And sucks for anyone else that she dates because no one will ever live up to this fantasy. <laughs> right. Same. These are the things I was thinking about in the six hours that this movie was. Yes, yes, yes. But anyway, so uh, he served his purpose. I don't even care at all that Jack dies and there was not really room for him anyway. Or it's not a, even a room, like a, like a surface area thing. It's more of a buoyancy issue. But no one ever talks about that. Anyway, um, 
Uh, but like swimming in cold water and like having to like try to find like a piece of debris to maybe float on that also like freezing to death is is uh, a horrible way to die um there's a guy who probably breaks his leg and other parts of his body when he hits the propeller which is like one of the most famous it's not like iconic in the sense that that's what like will get parodied or like there are no visual references to that ever but if you if i'm talking to someone and i'm like oh have you seen titanic because this is the question i ask everybody i meet uh so that i know whether or not i can be friends with them <laughs> no but they'll be like oh yeah i saw it like such a long time ago uh right when it came out the only thing i remember is the guy who hits the propeller when he's falling on the way down to, before he like hits the water and everyone remembers the old couple in bed spooning each other as like the their room is filling with water those are two of the most memorable <laughs> parts Which apparently of the is real yes i, I was... watched a video this morning about like <laughs> factor fiction in james cameron's titanic <laughs> i did for real <laughs> i was trying to find like a youtube video that like had some smart analysis about the movie to just see you know add a little bit of flavor to the viewing experience and i literally could only find these like bullshit mo- videos they were awful <laughs> but i learned a lot about what happened it didn't happen and <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that couple apparently a couple really did that and i as you see that scene you're like yeah, this is pretty good. It was. I'm not going to lie. Like, I felt something I, penetrate, you know, the tough, leathery exterior of my cold heart um, during that scene. Um, and then also, and God, Anita, feel free to just clown me for this because it's so obvious. But I did shed a tear when the band started playing mm. Nearer My God to Thee. I did. You know, mm-hmm. I'm just going to own it. Um, I knew it was coming. And yet I did feel a real human emotion. I'm also very real. uncomfortable with it. You know? Apparently the band really did play them yeah. to their deaths. Yeah. Um, That's another time where I was like, y'all better than me. Because I would have been, you know, like if I was one of those dudes, I would have been put on somebody's wig and fur coat and been like, please, stop. <laughs> I would have jumped in a lifeboat. But there's so many things that I would not have done in that situation, you know, so. Mm-hmm. All right. I mean, the guy with the cello, oh. I feel like, or whatever upright bass, that's a big enough thing. That I feel like you could float on that, maybe. <laughs> Look, okay, we are, I, I kept saying for the six hours of drowning, like, grab a fucking table. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I don't understand. Like, but like, that water is so cold. Even the fact that Rose survived is a miracle, you yeah, know? No, that's true. Like, that's true. after they had, had been in the water, like, but like, you would die so quickly. And once hypothermia sets in, it doesn't matter that you're now out of the water. I acknowledge she should have gone down with Jack. I acknowledge that like there is no we have no idea how we would react in this moment of impending death and that people are going to do all kinds of things or whatever. But in my like brain of let's be snooty about this and uh, whatever, like I would instead of going to the top of the ship and like trying to just like wait till the last moment, I would be like, what can I float on? Like, let's make some fucking rafts. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, so that that whatever. It's a fucking movie. <laughs> Let me just say that I was so certain that each, you know, like additional death scene, horrific death scene that we saw was the worst one um, mm. leading up to. You know, so we see the propeller guy, um, you know, the the folks falling down from the top of the boat into the water, which is just adding insult to injury. Right. Like you mm-hmm. break all your bones upon impact with the water by what chance you might still be alive. And now you're in frozen water in the middle of the ocean. I yeah. would. Oh, boy. I would try and drown as many people around me as I could just because I would be so bad at God. But the thing that got me, honestly, Mm-hmm. was when the lights go out yeah i that's the moment where i was like i no longer need to worry about this because if i was anywhere still on that ship or even in the water surrounding it and now it's pitch black in the middle of the ocean and i'm freezing to death quite simply my heart would have got so i don't need to worry about survival at that mm-hmm. point that's when it's all over for old ebbs when the lights go out you can't tell me that that was just like oh my god i I'm sweating thinking about it right now. The terror, if you're still trapped on that boat and you're trying to make it to the surface. That's why it's such an effective movie. It's so good and you're scared. And it's like, a, it's it's honestly, 
a an amazing disaster movie with incredible visual and mostly practical special effects uh which ha- also has like a cheesy period romance drama tacked onto the first half of it um yeah i'm all about like the the practical effects also this movie is like uh such like a terrific study in tension for one sequence in particular because obviously we with our our you know (laughs) awareness of history know that the titanic hit an iceberg and sank but the way the movie handles that scene where like it's approaching the iceberg they've spotted it they try to do a bunch of stuff to like steer out of the way and reverse the propellers and all that stuff it is so well done with like just the editing and the, the filmmaking, the score, the cinematography. Every time I watch the movie, I'm like, oh my God, is it going to hit the iceberg? Because <laughs> <I'm like, laughs> the, the, the tension, tension is, is my <laughs> what's going to happen. The movie handles the tension in that moment so well that like our intelligent brains shut off and like your emotional brain turns on and you're just like, what's going to happen? Oh my God. It, they, um, is, is it going to hit it? Is it going to miss? I don't know. I think they do. The, the fact that people like they do, it, it's, a, there's something interesting around the fact that like you can't see the forest for the trees or whatever the saying is. So mm-hmm. you have all these people who don't know what's happening and are just like milling about and ordering servants around and what have you. And like still aren't quite because I don't think that we can grapple with our own mortality in that way. So like there's something really interesting about the fact that like what you're saying is we kind of are like, oh, they're going to make it because everyone has to live and everyone's going to live. And so if you're on it, if you're on it, I think they did a really good job of showing that you'd be like, no, we can't actually die. This is the unsinkable ship. Like, Mm -hmm. we're going to be fine. Like, sure, fine. I'll put like I'll put this life vest on, but that's not real, you know, like and seeing a mount like the mounting tension of like people realizing that this is actually for real. I thought, yeah. And just like, you know, everything in my life is designed to keep me comfortable and existing. So why would I ever begin to doubt that in this moment? You know, there has never been a time in my life when it is my primacy, you know, my privilege has ever uh, left me in a precarious position. So of course, you know, my role as the main character in this story is assured. Of course, I'll survive. And of course, things are meant to, you know, um, be comfortable for me and not at all difficult. So, you know, when things are truly bad, that's when I'll leave off dancing and smoking cigars and drinking brandy. And someone will come get me and escort me to the lifeboat and make sure that, you know, there's no stinky poor people around me. You know, like, uh, of course. I feel like yeah. you can map the pandemic onto the events of the Titanic because <laughs> like you've got the all you know these like rich fucks who like the uh the the not the engineer but like the guy who funded the thing whose name is whatever but he's like a real historical guy who like got in a bunch of legal trouble after the thing uh anyway there's a line in the movie where he's like the ship can't sink <laughs> and then mr andrews um f- played by uh oh my god what is his name yes victor garber he goes she's made of iron i assure you she can um and she and she will <laughs> and so you have all these people like kind of denying that this is a thing and that you know we don't need life but they're just like the sheer ego of the whole thing like we're not gonna die we don't even need these lifeboats there's a waste of deck space blah 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 and then when like tragedy strikes and casualties start happening uh and similar to this pandemic that is like affecting a lot of like low-income people uh and not nearly as affecting like (laughs) higher like you know people of higher socioeconomic classes um there's just there's a lot of parallels is all i'm saying Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> we've gotten super over, so we're gonna skip freakouts this week. But we will, we will definitely bring back the freakout next week. Um, I will talk in the bonus about how I was surprised to see actual boobies. Suck Kate's boobs. <gasps> mm-hmm. Didn't know that was coming. 
Uh, uh, we also talk about how the conversation around Kate Winslet um, during this period was that, God, she's this close to plus size. She's still pretty, but she's kind of a big uh, girl. Do you uh, remember this? I mean, y'all yep. were pretty young, so you might have, but yeah. I remember. Um, yes, we're going to talk more about Titanic and the bonus is clearly what's going to happen. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for listening and coming back this season with us. We're going on a little wild ride trying to, I don't know, we're, we're just... We're just doing weird shit. That's what we decided. I don't think hurt as much as this did, though. Well, we haven't. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that's true. We'll see. I don't know. I, I have faith in us, Ebony, to torture ourselves. Well, you found some fantastic guests. So I do want to thank Caitlin because I, I would not have been as interested um, in watching this movie if I knew that we weren't going to talk to someone like you who mm-hmm. really had like fondness and like a sincere fondness for the film because it did force me to you know be more open you know to be more receptive to the things that were actually very well done in this film i would have i would have turned it off before then but i was like (laughs) no i'm not gonna let caitlin down she sees something in this movie i hear she might have some body art i think she might have modified her Mm. actual human body because of this film i'm gonna pay her the the honor of paying attention to this movie thank you so much the last thing i do want to say really quickly is that like a phenomenon happened with this movie and maybe even still continues to happen and i mean definitely still continues to happen uh but like specifically around this movie where a lot of stuff that is kind of like marketed toward like teen tween girls is automatically assumed by culture to be like really bad or just like so super silly and like nothing that anyone could take seriously and i think that's a lot of the reason that so many people like took pride (laughs) not that i'm saying like this about you two specifically but like a lot of people were like well this is a thing that girls like so this is is, like 90 percent of like men who i've talked to who like refuse to see this movie that's their sort of thing oh this this is what that sappy love story for tween like teen girls no thanks um in the way that like silly stuff marketed at like the same age range for boys like your like transformers movies and stuff like that is not held to the same um whatever like oh like those movies are cool and michael bay's cool um (laughs) so i just want to point out that i think a lot of like hatred toward this toward this movie comes from like a cultural sexist bias absolutely and Let's get into that in the bonus because I want to hear more about that and I want to say some stuff about that too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Caitlin, where can people find you? Caitlin Durante on Twitter and Instagram. You can check out my podcast, which also analyzes media, specifically movies, specifically Titanic, several times. (laughs) We usually only do each movie once, but we do have four or maybe five now episodes about Titanic. No, girl, are you serious? Well, I'm serious. Most of them are on our Patreon page, so they're behind a paywall. So I'm talking about elitism. But <laughs> <laughs> it's only appropriate. <laughs> but many, many episodes of the podcast, The Bechtel Cast, uh, in which my co-host, Jamie Loftus, and I analyze movies through an intersectional feminist lens uh, can be found uh free and accessible to all uh and that's again the bechtel cast b-e-c-h-d-e-l awesome sorry i'm making hand gestures i forgot that everyone <laughs> can see that my camera is being shitty um yes uh, uh bechtel cast is great i was on it recently talking about double indemnity mm-hmm. which was a pretty good episode i enjoyed that it was great so- and ebony will will have you on very soon if you'd like to come on can you talk about Titanic? Uh, uh, Ebony's like, no. <laughs> um, can we can we come on the Bechdel cast and have this exact same conversation <laughs> just on your podcast? Do you want yes. just do you want these audio files? And, and make your um make no, your but listeners the, want to jump ship. But I think what's the Bechdel cast, you'll actually go like moment to moment in the episode, in the movie. So we'll just talk about like beat by beat. It'll mm. be great. We should do that. We okay. could, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next week, we are diving into Ebony's childhood with Ridley Scott's legend. Speaking of another director who we should not watch anything else from. Oh. What? Um, and joining us for that conversation, the uh, the unicorn romp through the stars, I don't know anything about legend, is Charlie Jane Anders, which is one of our favorites. So tune in for that. Sweet. 
Our show is engineered by Rob Perra. Carrie Stimson provides technical support, artwork by Jamie Varon, and our intro music is by Phil Circus. Thanks for listening, and see you in the bonus.